Now, in discussing that, I want everyone to take time to meditate on what is God to you? Who is God to you? And where is God in your life? So while you take just a couple of minutes to meditate on that, we're going to listen to this song by Sister Mahalia. So take time and reflect on what is God and who is God in your life and where is God? That song, uh, that song does something to me when you think about how good God has been to you and how real God is for us as Christians. You know, uh, some of us have had a personal experience of God. And there's nothing, nothing, no one can say on this earth that can prove otherwise to us that God is real because we know him for ourselves. And that, that means something to us as Christians, that personal relationship, that God is real. But like I said, today, in this day and age, even some Christians have a hard time grasping with the, or, or, or accepting the concept that God is real. They know God is real. And yet, God has allowed COVID-19 to happen. Or God has allowed disease and death to happen in our lives. So how do we reconcile that as Christians? So I hope that you've taken that time to think about what God is to you and who God is to you and where he is in your life.
if we would, let's begin with just a word of prayer before we get into this scripture and into this word. Lord, our Father, come before you, thanking you, Lord, for another opportunity to fellowship, Lord, in your name and to gain insight and greater understanding of who you are to us, what you are to us, and how, Lord, we should better serve you in your kingdom. Lord, we do not have all the answers. And Lord, I am just a man. But I ask, Lord, that you impart your wisdom upon me and upon these people today so that, Lord, we may have just a minute understanding of your greatness and your vastness of our lives. Something, Lord, we can hold on to and something that can get us through this trying time, Lord. Lord, I ask that you please just wrap your arms around us, protect us, keep us, Lord, as we are here in our homes, as we are here, Lord, without any understanding of what is to come. But Lord, we know you hold tomorrow. We know you hold us safe and secure. And Lord, we know that through you, we should gain the foresight, understanding, and courage and peace, Lord, to make it through this thing. In your son, Jesus Christ's name, I do pray. Amen. Amen. So what is God? This is week two, and we're going to actually cover this section in three parts. Well, hopefully three parts. It may be four, but we're going to take our time with it. It's a big, this is, this is big. This is the crux of our whole belief system. What is God? Who is God? And where is God? So let me ask you, do I have a volunteer to tell us what is God? What is God? Yes, I hear someone. Do I have a volunteer? I was going to say, growing up, you first learned that God is love. And, God. you know, you also learned that he's, uh, he's, he's, He's all things. He's yeah. uh, he 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 is what he said. He he is what he who he is. I am that I am. So I like he, he's omnipotent. Can do all things. Can be all things. And he's our creator. Yes. Yeah. And our provider. Um. This is Deborah. Yes. I actually think that um, the what is God is kind of different for everybody, for each person. We we know what God is capable of. We we were taught what He's you know what His His strengths are, what He can do, and what have you. But as we get as as we get our personal relationship, I think God is different for people it, because it's a personal relationship what i what i say god is might be a little different from what somebody else says god is um <clears throat> and and it also depends for me um how i'm feeling sometimes when mm. i pray i'm praying to a woman mm -hmm. sometimes when i'm praying i'm praying to a man uh i never pray color but it just you know it, it's it's what i need for that moment because yes. for me, God is everything that I need. He He can provide that. So it just depends um, on the person, I think, as to what God is. I like that. I like that. And I agree. Uh, it definitely depends on your relationship to God and your circumstance, your background, culture, all those things, uh, you know, uh, plays a role. Let's see. I see someone raise their hand. Let me see. Uh, can we get Chandra to uh, un, uh, unmute her mic? Yeah. It's unmuted. Yes. You raise your hand. Let me hear what you got to say. This is my lovely aunt, Aunt Chandra. Aunt Shan, go ahead. Richard, you know, I am so proud of you. May God forever bless you. Thank you. But I would like to say, Richard, that I think God is love. Yes. And next, God is almighty. Yes. Yes, if we always remember that God can do anything, well, we have a friend. 
Yes, I, I agree. Look, I like what uh what Bruce and Chandra said with uh with God is love. So that's a definite attribute of God that we see in the Bible, constant in the Bible. Now, what we learn through biblical studies in our Bible is that uh, there are certain attributes of God, all right? So we have certain attributes of God. And what theologians have agreed upon is that there are six major attributes or characteristics of God that make God what God is. Now, we're going to talk, there's a difference between who God is and what God is. Who God is depends on your relationship, like Sister Deborah was talking about. But when we think about what the Bible has taught us about God, for God to be God, God has to be these six things. God has to be eternal. So that's without beginning and without end. God has to be omnipotent. So that is uh, all power. There's no power greater than God. Chris Mark. You also, um, I can't get someone to mute. All right. Then we have omnipresent. So omnipresent. Therefore, God is in all places. God is everywhere and in all things. Omniscient. God is all-knowing. Now, this one is good. This one is good. We're going to get into what the word says about this. Not only is God all-knowing, but God has all knowledge, meaning that God is in all things. God has a plan. Nothing happened by happenstance, but it's through divine, divine design. And then God is unequivocally just. This is something that catches people up. People may know that first four, but that fifth one, God is unequivocally just. That means that God loves no respective person. God has no favors. God does not do anything out of, out of hubris or out of him, God wanting uh, some need, something to gain. No, but it is just. It is right, always right. And then God is omnibenevolent. God is all good. All good. There is no bad, no evil in God. And I know that's going to that's gonna try to try some people right now as we're going through what we're going through. When you ask, well, why did God let certain things happen? So we're going to talk about that as well when we get into that omnibenevolent. Now remember, we're going to break this thing down. We're not going to be able to cover everything today. But we're going to break this thing down over the next few weeks. But we're talking about what is God. But then we talk about who is God. Who is God? Is a term anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. So anthropomorphism of God. That's how we see God. That's when we attribute to God human characteristics. When you say God wrapped his arms around, that helps us to understand God. We know God doesn't physically have arms that he's wrapping around us, but that's how we explain it. Because that's what that comfort, that's what that love feels like. When we say God reached his hand in the dirt and formed Adam and Eve, we know there was not a physical hand in the dirt, but that's how we explain it, that anthropomorphism of God. And like Sister Deborah said, Sister Deborah said, and now I know some old school Christians don't like this too much. It may ruffle some feathers with the old school. The old heads may say they don't like it. But how you can say God is mother? How can God be a woman? Well, we're going to talk about how that's actually in the scripture. It's scripture that supports that. So when Sister Deborah says sometimes she sees God as a woman, well, in the Bible it says God is wisdom. And in the Hebrew, Shekinah. In the Greek, Sophia. That is the female aspect or the female essence of God. That wisdom. Sometimes we say like a nurturing mother. That's what Jesus himself said of God. Comes to him sometimes as a nurturing mother. So we talk about that wisdom. You say your mom is always wise. Women are a little wiser than us. That female instinct, the intuition. That's that female aspect of God. Then we talk about the might of God, that power, the creating power, that El Shaddai, the principle. When we say that, that is the father. 
the power. So you have the, both mother and father in God. Then we also see God in our lives as the Holy Trinity, the Yahweh, the Jehovah, that's father. And then we see the Lagos or the, the uh, avatar of God, Jesus, God made flesh, God representation in this physical realm, the Logos. And then we see the comforter, the Holy Spirit. So we see that God manifests himself in different forms and different ways in our lives, depending on how we see him in that moment, like Sister Deborah was talking about. You may need to pray on God's wisdom. So you're appealing to that Shekinah light in God. Or you may feel like you need God to manifest something powerful in your life. So you're praying to that creator, the El Shaddai. Or you may just need a comfort. You call on the Holy Ghost. Because you don't know anything else to do but just utterance of, of, of power you need to manifest in your life. So that's who is God. And remember, if you type your uh, email address in the chat, I will be able to uh, email you a copy of this. Some of you got a copy of last week's uh, today. And I, I'll even catch you up to speed if you didn't get last week's. I'll give you both last week's and today's uh, PowerPoint. So. Now, then we talk about where is God? Where is God? The heavens. And it's important we understand that when the Bible speaks of heaven, it always denotes heaven in two ways, either heaven with a capital H, heaven, or the heavens, lowercase h. But we'll talk about the difference. We'll talk about on earth, where does God reside on earth? And when we talk about heaven and earth, something always comes up in discussion with Christians, and just as much as it does with atheists, and that is creationism versus evolution. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about where was God in all this process. Where was God? And where is God? And you'll notice that I didn't say creationism versus evolution. I said creationism and evolution. We're going to talk about that. We're going to get deep in this thing. But that's further down the line. We're going to start with God, the uncaused God. I mean, the uncaused cause. God, the uncaused cause. That is today's lesson. Today's lesson is God is eternal, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. So we're going to start with those four. And then next week, we'll pick up with God being unequivocally just and omnibenevolent. But today, God is eternal. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. And God is omniscient. If an atheist asks you about God, what would your answer be? I want everyone to take time to think about that. If an atheist were to ask you about God, what would your answer be? Would you dismiss them? Would you tell them God's ways are not our ways? Would you quote a bunch of scriptures at that atheist? Or would you try to have meaningful dialogue to lead them to God in Christ? I want a volunteer to tell me if you've had a time where you were confronted by someone who was not a non-believer or an atheist. Yes, yeah, yeah, who was that? That was me, Tisha. All right, Tisha, tell me about a time God uh, or you were confronted by an atheist, was it frustrated? Was it frustrating? Like, how, how was it? And what did you do ultimately when you discussed God with them? I mean, to be honest with you, I've gotten into a couple of conversations and I'm using the word conversation very lightly <laughs> um, with atheists. Um, and I found myself to be frustrated. And my frustration comes from that a lot of the times, and this is just my perception of the situation, um, is that I don't believe that a lot of atheists, when they do ask you about God, that they're actually seeking knowledge or even seeking your perception, your 
your perspective on this on your belief i think a lot of the times or the atheists that i've encountered um are all there to kind of antagonize um and disprove you to make you seem like you're stupid so with me personally while i know that i should be having mean meaningful dialogue with them i just ultimately dismiss them like i'm not i don't i don't really have once i realize that someone is an atheist i'm just like bye and it can be it can it can be quite frustrating and it can be quite frustrating you know there's scripture that says cast not your pearls of wisdom amongst the swine so it's real easy to say well i didn't I, I i i can't i can't help you and walk away but at the same time we're called to disciple we're called to fish we're called to to bring people in and so i would just encourage everyone to think about how would you approach that subject are you equipped are you equipped to discuss with someone who's going to bring science and bring you know um, their hardcore beliefs to you that of what they think about god are you equipped to tell them why is god you know what is god who is god are you equipped to bring that person to god and then to christ and it can it can be hard it can be hard especially uh for the ministers it can be very hard uh but uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna give ourselves some equipment though today is it possible to reconcile science and religion when it comes to god science is mankind's attempt to rationalize god using the rules of the physical realm to explain the spiritual realm so science is trying to rationalize something that could be perceived as irrational according to their own rules that they set they set these rules for this world is scientific law scientific rules and they are trying to use those to explain something that's bigger than science but science makes an attempt at it science does not refute god science just cannot explain god fully there's certain things that science just cannot explain and that's when the scientists stop and say well you can't prove it and so that's when the christian response is well you can't disprove it but we're going to talk about that there's certain things that science does prove for the existence of god and certain things that it just is incapable of doing why is it incapable of doing that well god is wondrous Job 11, verse 7 through 9 teaches us that. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths below. What can you do? Or what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? God is wondrous. His ways are wondrous. Not God works in mysterious ways, but God works in wondrous ways. We can't even fathom the concept of God. God is so great. But yet science tries to. Science tries to disprove God. And in doing so, science proves everything we know to be true, that God does exist. What does the Bible say? God is eternal. I'm going to give you a few scriptures. I want you to make sure that you jot down the scriptures. You don't have to worry about writing them out in complete text, but you may want to just jot down the uh, reference so you can go back and read it for yourself over the week. And I'm going to make sure I email you. But what does the Bible say? God is eternal. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth he does not faint or grow weary his understanding is unsearchable isaiah 40 28 god is eternal the everlasting god creator of the ends of the earth what does the bible say god is eternal before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting you are god 
Reminds me of the Marvin Sapp song, You Are God Alone. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, from end to end. But not from end to end, from everlasting. There is no beginning, there is no end. That's eternal. See, everlasting means it keeps on going. Eternal means that it never started. It always was, always is, and always will be. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. What uh, does the Bible Rich. say about omnipotence? What does the Bible say about God is omnipotent? For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Colossians 1 verse 16. And when they talk about thrones and powers, they're talking about celestial beings that reside in heaven. We learn more about these beings throughout the Bible. Isaiah talks about them quite a bit. A lot of the mentioned in the Old Testament and in the Revelations, the hierarchy of angels, as we call it. And the thrones and powers are this high, this the high-ranking angelic hosts in heaven. And it says that whether they're thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all have been created. So even the most powerful the most powerful angels have been created through him and for him. We're talking about God. In this sense, they were talking about God in the form of Jesus. And they talked about how Jesus is God. But God created all of this. All powerful. Then what does the Bible say? God is omnipotent. Jesus looked straight at him and answered. This is impossible for human beings. He was talking about passing through the eye of a needle. A rich man passing through uh, into heaven is like uh, hard, as hard as a camel passing through the eye of a needle. Jesus looked at him and said, this is impossible for human beings. But for God, everything is possible. Everything. Jesus said, for God, everything is possible. Matthew 19, 26. We're gonna. I want you to think about these scriptures. As we're, we're running through these scriptures because we're going to juxtapose these scriptures to science. And we're going to talk about God in the natural light of this world. But I want you to think about these scriptures as we go through them because when we go through the science, you'll see how the science proves the scriptures. God is omnipotent. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Head above all. First Chronicles 29, 11. God is exalted as head above all. The greatness and power, glory, victory, and majesty of all, of all. So not just here on earth, but also in the heavens. Not just in the physical realm, but also in the spiritual realm. God reigns supreme. Now let's talk about omnipresent. Remember, in all places. The God who made the earth and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. So this scripture in Acts 17, 24 establishes that God is not confined to just the church house. God is not confined just to the holy places. No, God cannot be confined. God is in everywhere and of all things, Lord of heaven and earth. You know, when we consecrate the church, uh, the prayer of concentration, uh, consecration and invocation, we invite God to come in. We say that this place is now holy and we invite God to come in to our hearts and come into this place. Now, we know that God is everywhere and in all, all things, but what we're really saying is we're inviting our mind, our spirit, to open up and receive God. And we're going to talk about that as well. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Colossians 1.17. He is before all things, 
and in him all things hold together. That's big. In him all things hold together. I want you to put a pin on that, but we're going to come back to that. So not only is God everywhere, but in him is everything else. Just going to run through a couple of more scriptures because we want to make sure that we're Bible-based here. Omnipresent. No one can hide where I cannot see them. Do you not know that I am everywhere and in heaven and on earth? Nowhere, nowhere anyone can go. Anyone can hide. No deed you can do can escape the vastness of God. God is everywhere. There's nothing that he does not know. Do you know that I am everywhere and in heaven and on earth? Jeremiah 23, 24. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. Omniscient. So that omniscience, all-knowing. By his understanding stretched out the heavens. Jeremiah 10, 12. Now you'll find that some atheists will come to you and they'll say, well, I believe that maybe there's a God, there's a force that, 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 that controls the universe, but I don't believe that Everything was designed by a divine creator. It was a divine design. I don't believe that, that something moved the pieces and something created everything. But we know that the Bible teaches that his understanding stretched out the heavens. It was God's own understanding who established the world. It was his wisdom. It was God who saw all this to create all this. Remember what happened long ago acknowledge that I alone am God and that there is no one else like me. From the beginning, I predicted the outcome. Long ago, I foretold what would happen. I said that my plans would never fail, that I would do everything I intended to do. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, that there is intent. Everything happened for a reason. It was by God's intention, God's design. That God alone, there's no other like him. God alone predicted, foretold what would happen from the very beginning until the outcome that we don't even see happen. Last one. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so they are without excuse. Romans 1, 20. God's divine nature has been clearly perceived since the beginning of creation. God's divine nature is seen throughout the world. There's no excuse not to know God and see God when we, in everything, we see a bit of God. So what does science theorize? So now, now, we're about to get heavy. If you, if you need a minute, if, if you want to give me some feedback on the scripture, let me know the scripture, because we're going to talk now about what does the science theorize and how we reconcile the two. Anyone have any input on those scriptures? I know it's a lot. Like I said, this is amplified. We're going to go deep. We're not surface level here. Anyone? All right. What does the science theorize? Science teaches us that in the beginning, there was one thing that existed. There was something that existed. It called it a super condensed God particle. So science says in the beginning, there was this thing that existed out in nothing. It was just this thing out there. Now the Bible tells us that the heavens and earth was shapeless and void. So it was a thing out there. It was, it was shapeless, void. And then this thing, this particle, God particle, collapsed on itself. So it became real tight, like a fist. It became tight like a fist. And it resulted in matter. So it, it, it caused things to disperse. When it pulled on itself, and this thing happened that it caused this particle to push on itself, it poofed out and caused all the matter and all the energy, everything that we see in this realm, it caused it to come to be. 
from it being pushed down. And it said that that expanding particle that pushed down and, and continued to spread out, we call it the universe. So this thing that was one small, a small particle had something collapse on it and it pushed out and it caused the universe. Now, science also tells us that an object at rest, so something at rest will stay at rest until something outside of it causes it to move. Until something outside of it causes it, some type of force, gravitational force, causes it, pulls it, and pushes it to move. So remember, there was this thing, science said there was this thing that existed, that particle, and it collapsed on itself and pushed out and created the universe. But science also tells us that this object will remain exactly still, not do anything unless something comes outside of it and causes it to move. The universe and every single thing in it is constantly expanding outward from its center in all directions. That's what scientists tell us, that everything that was in that small particle that now expanded, our universe, is still expanding is moving out in all directions from its center. So it's moving out towards something. Now, science also tells that all objects, all objects move or are pulled toward other objects with greater and larger mass. So the everything in the universe, the universe itself is moving outward towards something that is more massive than the universe. For these things and for the universe to move out, it has to be moving toward something greater that's outside of that universe. So what is science scared to answer? What created that first particle? Remember, matter is neither created nor destroyed. What created this particle? That particle, that particle in science is so hung up on, they call it the Big Bang Theory. Every scientist come to you and say, but there was this particle. Well, what created that particle? What was the outside force that collapsed on that particle? Remember, the particle wouldn't have collapsed unless something caused it to collapse. So what was that force that caused that particle to collapse on itself? What was that force that must have existed outside the particle? And thus, that force is outside our universe. Since that particle created our universe, what was that force outside that universe that created that universe? What was the force that must continue to act and permeate through that particle to sustain that outward expansion? Remember, it's expanding outward. So what is that force that still must be going through the particle and still acting on it? What is that entity, this force that exists outside the particle and is so extraordinarily massive, is so big that everything within our universe is gravitating towards it? It must be something that is so big, so great, so massive outside of our universe that everything in our universe is constantly seeking it. Our universe is seeking God. What is that thing? The answer is God. That's what science drops the ball on. When you, next time you speak to that atheist and they have those questions, those points, and they want to talk about what is God, you can tell them what God is. The uncaused cause. The beginning of their beginning is God. God picks up where they left off. So God answers the questions scientists cannot answer. God is. Therefore, God is. What is God? God is the extra outside, extra universal force. God is the extra universal force and energy that brought the universe into existence, that exists beyond time and space, that permeates throughout the universe, that exists in every corner and every crevice of the universe that is all things, is in all things, and sustains all things. God is the invisible quantum strings that connects everything that is and 
everything that was and everything that ever will be. God is the all and all. Science knows it. Science proves it. Science just refuses to call this cosmic force and energy God. But we know the name. God is. We know that power that resonates through this world. Like we said in the matrix, we know it. When we have a good vibration, when we have that good frequency, when we know that we're in balance, when we know that the world is moving, when we have that going on in our world, we know that God is. Any questions so far? Any questions? Have any questions? No. All right. We moving, we cooking, we cooking with grease. We cooking with grease. Even though we know all that, we still know less than 1% of 1% of 1% of nothing when it comes to understanding the vastness and greatness of God. We have to understand that even though we can theorize all that, we can read every book. And I've read a lot of them. I'm trying, I'm searching, I'm seeking God. And when you do all that, you still understand it. You don't know. You can't understand. What did it say in Job? It's vastness. We can't understand. How can we perceive? But yet, we each come to understand God in our own way. The who is God. We understand that love. We understand what God means to us. But I hope that today I was able to give you just a little bit of understanding of how. I guess some folks come to rationalize God in this world and what the scripture says about it. We must continue to seek God, seek God to reveal himself to us. We all should pray that we should see God's glory here in the land of the living. That it, I not have to wait till heaven to call heaven my home before I know God on this earth. That is what I left an atheist with one time when I spoke with atheists. And it's one of the proudest days of my life. Joseph Daggs, I invited him to come join us. He didn't join us today, but hopefully he'll join us once, one day. Uh, but Joseph, I brought him to Christ in a one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't through a sermon. It was through just speaking to him. Joseph was my barber when I lived in Durham. And he found out I was a minister. And Joseph was atheist. And Joseph asked me, Joe asked me tons of questions. And unlike uh, the atheist in uh, Tisha's uh, recant when she uh, recount when she said that uh, the atheist was was trying to prove a point, Joseph was just authentically curious. He wanted to know, and that challenged me to go deep in my bag. That challenged me to say, I have an opportunity here to either minister to this young man and bring him to Christ from the very beginning, from I don't know nothing about God. Or I can just say, well, you know, God's ways are not our ways. You, maybe you'll find them one day for yourself. But I decided I'll take upon that challenge. How do you preach God? How do you teach God to someone who has no concept of God? None at all. Who has no frame of reference, never went to Sunday school, didn't grow up in a in a in a family with, with that went to church, never sat through Sunday service. How do you do it? God is all around us, but we must seek his spirit. How do we do it? We engage, we educate, and we empower. We can't run from it. We have to engage. God, Jesus has called us to be disciples. Jesus has spoken to our hearts and called us to bring people to Christ, each of us in our own way. Each of us is a minister in our own way. Some are preachers, some are musicians, some in the choir, some on the usher board, but each of us has our ministry. So the next time that you have an opportunity to engage with a non-believer, attempt to minister to them. It may take some parables, may take some science and common sense and it may take some prayer. It's definitely gonna take some patience, but we must cast our net wide and deep and we must at least try. And that's today's lesson on 
who or what is God? Have any feedback? I know we I know we covered a lot. Do I have any feedback? Anyone want to go to a previous slide? I have some feedback. Yes, yes. Tisha, here. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, to me, I guess maybe because. I've always grown up in the church, so of course, my experience is, you know, biased because I do have a frame of reference, but it just seems very simple to me. Um, even if you try to use science to explain God, what is that thing that, who was that thing that created that thing that just was out there, you know, and who was it that push that thing down on top of each other to cause it to collapse. To me, the only answer would be God. That's the only answer it, that makes sense to me. But yes. a, a lot of people are scared to acknowledge that there's something out there that, that, that they cannot explain. Yes, yes. Is it, it's, it's scary. I, I, what I find with some atheists and some people who don't believe in God is that it's it's scary for them to admit that there's something bigger than them, to admit that there's something out there that's more powerful than themselves. Because in their world, they control everything. And oftentimes when I come across atheists, these are people who are in high positions. These people who are elevated in life, who feel as if they of their own accord have made things happen. So then how do you explain to them that no, is by God's grace, that the only difference between you and the homeless man on the street is that God's grace said that God wanted that person's journey, that person's testimony to be there and your testimony to be here. Because at any moment, it can be changed. At any moment, you can be on the other side of that fence. But by God's grace, you are where you are. And therefore, by God's grace, you should be where you will be and going forward. Any other questions? Any 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 other feedback? Well, I have one. This is uh this is Uncle Bruce. Uh yes. I was uh when you spoke about the the vastness of God in terms of the universe and the vastness. And you know, you kind of put that in perspective when you start talking about how big God is and the things he's done. Uh, I was watching one of the, uh, the, the Discovery Channel TV shows, uh, and they were talking about one of the spacecraft that uh, we launched about 40, 45 years ago, one of the Voyager spacecrafts, one of those uh, going out. And to put it in perspective, the, the spaceship's been traveling like 50,000 miles an hour for the last 40, 45 years, and it's gone beyond the known universe, the nine planets that we know about. And it's gone beyond that, and they turned around, turned it around. They took a picture of the of our little solar system, and it's still going. So, you, and it, it, it just, it's just, it's just going to keep going forever. But wherever that that ship goes, you know, it's what God made, and you you can't even in our mere mortal minds, we can't even fathom how big that is. And it's out there, keep going, but wherever it goes, it's 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 of God. It's, he made that. It's yes. part of his creation. Yes. When when you think about the vastness of God, how great is God to create a universe, the whole universe, you know, it puts things in perspective. You know, and I meet some people and they, they call themselves spiritual. Remember, we talked about spiritual and, and religious, and we talked about uh and I meet some people. And they'll say, you know, the universe calls this to happen, or the universe. They, it's like they're scared to say God. They want to say the universe. But when you really think about God and God's greatness and vastness, you begin to understand that it's disrespectful to say the universe calls something when God calls the universe. God is the cause. There is no universe without God. So it's not the universe. The universe is a thing. It's a, it's an entity. These are things. These are objects. These are these are uh, bosons and fermions and, and and matter and mass particles. No, no, no. God is that energy. God is that force. God is what causes. And when you think about what God causes in your life, then you can 
have that meditate on your heart and you can begin to apply it. You can start looking at your own life and say, God is causing things to happen. God is moving, as we say. You know, you feel God moving. Do I have anyone else? Uh, hey, it's Kiara. I just wanted to say that I appreciate this lesson simply because it's causing me to think deeper about what I think. And I honestly am not prepared for anybody to ask me any serious questions um, about God because I've realized that I haven't thought enough about it myself. So I appreciate the scriptures that you've given and kind of like what Tisha said, I've never really thought about it because God just always was. Um, for me, because that's how I was raised, but you're right, for somebody who wasn't raised the way that I was raised, how would I explain that to them if that's not a part of their normal? So um, I think it is important, especially when we think about growing in our faith and potentially evangelizing to other people that we have to know our stuff and we have to have a true understanding because if, if not, I'm just gonna be standing there saying, you know, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. I mean, you know, I'm just going to be spitting out things that I've heard, but not really telling them anything. So yes. this was good for me. Yes. Thank you for that. Exactly. Um, and that, remember when we talked about in the first lesson uh, last week, we talked about spirituality and we talked about uh, knowing God and how God reveals himself. Remember, we, we discussed that you... Do you know God for yourself because you've studied? Do you know God for yourself because you've experienced God? Or do you know God because someone taught you God? Someone told you that you should know God. How many of us believe because we have come to believe or versus how many of us believe because Sunday school teacher told us to believe? And that's, that's, that's powerful, especially when we get into relationship with Christ. Because I met Christ myself as an adult, even though I was raised in the word and raised in, in a home that brought me up. It wasn't until I had some experiences that brought me to Christ that I said, hey, I know Christ for myself. And each of us will have what, what I call that road to Damascus experience with Christ. So we're going to talk about that as well. Like I said, this thing gets deep. We, this is just part one of what is God? Who is God? Where is God? Uh, next week, we'll pick up with the last two attributes or characteristics of God, which are uh, unequivocally just and omnibenevolent. Remember, God is unequivocally just and God is omnibenevolent. Those two we're going to spend some time on, especially when we talk about how does evil exist in the world. We talk about why God allows certain things to happen. So uh, make sure that you have put in a chat. Uh, I see my pastor joined us, Pastor Crawford. I heard your whole piece, Doc. So uh, thank you. Do, you, do you have any uh, anything you'd like to add for for uh, those who have joined us? I want to give the floor to, to my pastor, this is Reverend Dr. No. Marvin Crawford. No, I'm not at all. Thank you for um, for for those for that lesson. I, I, you know, in my mind, though, you know, I never see our science and religion in opposition, and um, and maybe because of where I, what I do every day and where I've been, I always see them as being uh, really compatible in terms of um, um, their thought pattern. For instance, um, you brought the theory about how the Earth came into being, the Big Bang theory, and et cetera, and there are four or five others there after how it came into being. If you look at all of them, um, uh, uh, they really don't, do, you can't prove none of the science that they talk about in terms of how things came to be, it's speculations. We yeah. never think about it, it's just speculation. You say, well, the Big Bang, where was the Big Bang? You said it happened a million years ago. Really, how you know it happened a million years ago? And it's so becoming to speculations. Then on the religion side, read the book of Genesis and you compare them together and God moved upon the face of the deep and A, B, C, D, and E took place. And you find out then that um, uh, uh, the writers then, they too, like the scientists, uh, but long before them, were thinking about 
how do I explain about how things came into being? They was moved by higher powers to write or by God to write that it came into being because God did it. And, and, and guess what? You can't prove it. Um, uh, they sound alike. Uh, be honest with you, the Big Bang Theory said, out of the darkness, God made A, B, C, D. And look at it. They say, they, this came into being, and the book says, and out of the darkness, God made the heaven and the earth. He moved upon the face of the deep, etc." So you find out the language of both are the same. It's very comparable language. Uh, it's just that folks gave so much argument with the two, they never compare them together and, and tell the truth. So I always tell folks who say they don't believe, I'm going, well, basically, since the biblical text was written first, and the thought that we have about how earth came into being came later, you know, it's P.S. though y'all borrowed the language and just took the <laughs> word God out to explain what was going on. And I think that's what we, what we actually see. One of my papers in seminary was on that reconciling of the two ideas together. And I, and I did it from just Genesis 1 and 2, took the scientific thought, compared them together. And, you know, so both, uh, both the science and the religion are tempted to explain the reality. It just, in science, uh, they are using facts. In religion, in spirituality, we are using faith. And, yes, and, 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 and nobody can discount our faith. And, um, and you have to bring your faith to the table. And I would tell anybody who encounters anybody who say God is not, the most important piece of what you hinted at, Richard, is that the persons come to know God not by what others told them, but what, by what they experience. And you always bring to the table your experience. Nobody can argue with your experience. It's like the drunk man or the drug addict or others, uh, uh, they argue with them and said, the story says, and say, you all don't know God. And they say, I do know God. And they say, how, what you mean you know him? I know him because I used to use drugs. I used to do this, but now I'm this. And that experience explains it. One of my professors in seminary, Dr. John Diamond, at the peak of his career and leaving Boston University, filled with deep knowledge about good, good, good theology, had come to a point where he said he didn't believe the Bible or anything else. I tell the truth in the seminary class, he threw the Bible on the floor uh, uh, on my first day of seminary. He said, I do this, some of y'all going to quit seminary. Um, some did, but I didn't. I was amused by it more than anything else. I just hope he didn't step on it because I didn't want lightning to come down. But anyway, I was amused by it. And 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 and. But John Diamond, before he left his world, I would tell you, uh, found himself back at Big Belt's church again. And I would tell you, since I was his understudy, I studied with him and on some private lessons. And he confessed one time. He said, "You know, I do all that in the classroom." He said, "But you know, my son was on drugs." And I sent him to program after program after program, physician after physician after physician. He said, but you know, one day my son went by a Pentecostal church and he heard the sounds and folks shouting. And he stopped in just to get some rest and get off the streets for a few minutes. And the guy told him, you got problems. God can hear you. He said, son, said, okay, I believe it. The man said, do you? He came up. The man prayed for him. He came back again over a month's time and from that month time of going in he got off drugs and his son stayed drug free hmm. until the very day if he's still living at that time he was 20 some years free but the experience proves god more than quoting the bible to him more than using the signs more than using logic so i pray to all of us at the end of the day you bring your experience to the table god bless you thank you richard god bless thank all you, of Dad. you Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's a beautiful note to live to, to end on, Pastor's words. And I look forward to seeing you all again next week. Uh, please make sure you put your email addresses in the chat. If you haven't done so, please take time to do that very quickly, so that uh, we can make sure we send you out an invitation to next week. Reminder for next week. Some of you got a reminder uh, today. So we send you a reminder for next week and send you the scriptures and the PowerPoint so that you can, uh, you know, meditate and pray on it throughout the week. Do I have a volunteer to pr uh, the dismiss us in prayer? Do I have a, a volunteer?
Last week was Bruce. Don't make me call him on you. I'll do it. <laughs> Let's mute our phones and bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity to come together and learn more about you. No, we want to thank technology because it's bringing folk who probably would never come to a Bible study, and we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord God, for all of the blessings that you have given us. We thank you, Lord God, because we know without you, we would have nothing. And we thank you, God, because you are seeing us through. It is through our faith in you, Lord God, that we can persevere over this time. And though we are human and we worry, we don't fear as much because we know that everything is in your hands. Now, Lord, if we, you would be so kind as to extend to us your blessings for this week so that we can have peace in our hearts, peace in our mind, and we continue, Lord God, to raise your name and lift you up because you are the reason for us being here and you are our, our hope and our strength. And all of these things we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, everyone. I'll see you all next week. And thank you for coming out uh, to Amplified Lessons for Christian Living. Have a blessed one.